Hi guys, Dane and Biggie here. You can say hello, buddy. And uh, today it is time for my April reading wrap-up. I'm actually going to shoot this over a couple of different days because there are a lot of books to go through. And also my camera battery is dying and it's getting kind of late. So I'm going to do as much as I can and then we'll go from there. So jumping straight into it. The uh, first book on the list is a Good Food, Eat Well, a Vegetarian and Vegan Dishes. Uh, this is by the BBC. It's just a little cookbook. As I mentioned in previous reviews, basically I consider a cookbook to be fully read once I've tested out all the recipes I want to try in it. I actually go through them all when I get them and list all of the ones I try want to try and then methodically go through them. And this was all right. It's probably like a 3.5 or a 4 out of 5. Um, most of them are just vegan dishes and even the vegetarian ones, I think they tell you how you can veganize them. There were some pretty good recipes in there, but it's probably not my, my favorite. So yeah, 3.5 out of 5. Okay, so next up we have The Station 17 Chronicles by Ollie Jacobs. Ollie is an indie author from High Wycombe, which is where I live. I've read a bunch of his books before. I actually picked this up for Tarden Danes indie read along. And there will be a video about this and some other books coming soon because I read quite a lot of indie this month. Uh, this wasn't my favorite of Jacobs' books. I do like the concept, not necessarily the execution, I guess. I would say it's basically two novellas and then a little short story at the end and it all covers the Station 17 which is uh, like a research station, I believe it's on the top of a mountain and uh, you know all sorts of strange experiments are being carried out there and we follow in these two novellas like the different stories of some of the people that are get involved there so the first one is about an ex-cop called Terry King and then the second one follows Kent Hawks who is the co-CEO of the company that owns the station and he kind of goes in there to investigate what's what happened. And I mean, I'm not saying it's not worth reading. I just don't think it was Jacobs' best. I gave it like a three out of five. Um, not terrible, not fantastic, but certainly, again, the concept of the Station 17 I thought was quite interesting. Okay, then we have Graham Greene, The Captain and the Enemy, and Graham Greene is one of my favorite authors, so I've sort of been slowly working my way through his books. Uh, let's see, it's been a while since I've read this one actually. This one, I do remember, yeah, I do remember this actually. So, it's basically about a young man who goes to uh, track down the captain, or who he knows as the captain. I'm going to give you this uh, little bit of, it's not exactly a blurb, because I don't think this has a blurb, this edition. But um, it's got a, a, an excerpt here, so... I am now in my 22nd year, and yet the only birthday which I can clearly distinguish among all the rest was my 12th, for it was on that damp and misty day in September that I met the captain for the first time. I can still remember the wetness of the gravel under my gym shoes in the school quad, and how the blown leaves made the cloisters by the chapel slippery as I ran recklessly to escape from my enemies between one class and the next. I slithered and came to an abrupt halt while my pursuers went whistling away, because there in the middle of the quad stood our formidable headmaster, talking to a tall man in a bowler hat, a rare sight already at that date so that he looked a little like an actor in costume, an impression not so far wrong, for I never saw him in a bowler hat again. So uh, yeah, I did enjoy this, I'd give this like a 3.75 out of 5, and I think the thing for me that is most interesting about this is the relationship between the uh, main character and the captain, and the character of the captain as well, you know, He's a liar, basically, so you never really know what's true and what isn't. And then after that, I read It's a Battlefield by Graham Greene, and um, this is taking place in uh, in England in the 1930s. So uh, basically what happens here is uh, a communist bus driver is uh, imprisoned, he's charged with murder, and he's been sentenced to death. Uh, basically, he killed a police. Well, it says here, he has killed a policeman in a riot at Hyde Park Corner because he believed that the policeman was going to strike his wife. And then... We basically start to see all these different people coming together, trying to plead his case, trying to get him saved. We get to see how he's reacting to the situation. It's also interesting because of this whole way that communism is dealt with. Um, I think, you know, in 1930s England, it was a genuinely a very real threat. But then it's almost as though this man is treated badly because he is a communist, you know. And um, I don't know. I think we can all agree, no matter what political views we hold, no one should ever be punished for holding their political views, you know, they should be punished for committing crimes or, or whatever, but just simply holding a belief, you know, people can believe what they want, can't they? Alright, uh, 3.5 for this one, I think. Okay, then we have The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, and I actually filmed a review of this that involved me kind of reacting to my previous review. Um, so I will link that below if you want to check that out. Uh, the first time I read this was last year and I gave it a 5 out of 5. This time on a reread I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. Still held up very well. I listened to it on audiobook as part of uh, Rereadathon 2019. And yeah, what can I say? It was my favourite book of last year and um, you know, 
it was great. It's it, it is still great. It's just as good as it was when I first read it. You know. Well, it's point zero point five, not as good, I guess. You know. Okay, then we have Karen Slaughter, Last Breath. So I actually picked this up while I was on, on holiday in Spain, my uh, my dad's house out there. I saw this in the charity shop, and I picked it up because I know that Harriet Rosie is a big Karen Slaughter fan. My mum actually reads Karen Slaughter as well, so kind of I've never heard anything bad about her, and I've heard a lot of good. So I thought I'd pick this out and check it check it out, and it it certainly was a pretty good introduction to her work. I think. I mean, it's basically a novella. But it has a lot of what or what I understand is like Karen Slaughter's so strong points. So it's it's quite gritty and um, at, at some points, but also it's got these really strong female sort of characters and female relationships between the two as well. Uh, yeah, I'll read you the blurb because it's always hard to sort of summarize what a thriller is about. You know, protecting someone always comes at a cost. At the age of thirteen, Charlie Quinn's childhood came to an abrupt and devastating end. Two men, with a grudge against her lawyer father, broke into her home, and after that shocking night, Charlie's world was never the same. Now a lawyer herself, Charlie has made it her mission to defend those with no one else to turn to. So when Flora Faulkner, a motherless teen, begs for help, Charlie is reminded of her own past and is powerless to say no. But honest student Flora is in far deeper trouble than Charlie could ever have anticipated. Soon she must ask herself, how far should she go to protect her client, and can she truly believe everything she is being told? So yeah, uh, I gave this like a 3.75 out of 5. It was a pretty good introduction to Slaughter and I would definitely consider reading some more of her work in the future. All right, it's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. I'm feeling all right. And I'm gonna continue doing the wrapper. Here we have Spike Milligan, Monty, his part in my victory. This is volume three of Spike Milligan's war memoirs. It's really hard to talk about any of these individually because they start to blend together a little bit. Uh, I will read you the blurb, I guess, why not? Look out, Eric Scott, here it is. Britain's looniest war hero completes a third volume of the Milligan memoirs. The 19th battery forge into tuners, cocksure and carefree. They climb an aqueduct with no trousers on, the battery that is. The aqueduct was very well dressed. 500 gunners try to dance with two girls and an old French matron. Up there in Valhalla, Monty's laughing fit to burst. So yeah, just sort of, I, I guess it's very British humour. It's kind of quite colonialist at times, to be honest. His uh, sense of humour hasn't aged well. We have some photos and some illustrations and stuff. And if you're interested in the Second World War, you know, it's worth a read. And oh, part of it just fell off. There we go, lovely. Uh, I gave that like a, probably like a 3.5, maybe a 3.25 out of 5. Let me stick in with the war theme, I guess. Here is Wilfred Owen, Anthem for Doomed Youth, Penguin Classics, Little Black Classic number 50. The great First World War poet portrays firsthand the horror, devastation and futility of the trenches. So as always with poetry, I will read you some. Let's read Futility, that seems like a good one to go for. Move him into the sun, gently its touch awoke him once. At home, whispering of fields half sown. Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old sun will know. Think how it wakes the seeds, woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs so dear achieved, our sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. Was it for this the clay grew tall? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break earth's sleep at all? So yeah, I give it like a 3.5 out of 5. Um, yeah, I don't know. I was expecting to like it more. I've never actually really read Wilfred Owen, but I kind of... I know a lot of people really respect him as a poet, and he's kind of the poet of the First World War. And I've, like, read one-off poems by him before, but I, I don't know whether I particularly enjoyed the full collection. Maybe they just weren't the best poems to go with, you know? Then we have Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, My Dearest Father, Penguin Little Black Classic number 51. Entertaining, touching and sharp tongue letters between the great 18th century composer and his mentor father. The main thing that stood out to me from this was the relationship between Mozart and his father. Mozart's father did not think very highly of his son really. He was constantly having a go at him and basically telling him he was doing things wrong. Uh, he, he, he kind of get the impression that Mozart was kind of inept. And uh, then there's this weird bit as well where Mozart's mum died and he wrote to his dad to say mum's not very well knowing that she was dead and then his dad wrote back being like I know you're just saying that she's not very well because she's dead and you don't want to upset me and it's just a very strange sort of series of events but um yeah I mean quite interesting to read just for the I guess for the historical context that they're in as well uh, and also obviously if you like Mozart's music if you're a classical music fan you're gonna like it 
I give it a 3.5 out of 5. Then we have Death Note Black Edition Volume 2, Death Note Black Edition Volume 3. These are by Tsugumi Oba and Takeshi Abata. I can't say too much about these really because I don't want to give away spoilers, but there is a big, it's a big twist in book 3 I guess which actually I think the series sort of didn't really recover from. So the first collection of this, I think I gave a 4.5 or a 5 uh, out of 5. The second one I gave a 4.5 out of 5 to. The third one was a 4 out of 5, uh, but still very much worth reading. This tells the story of Light Yagami, a student who finds a thing called the Death Note, and basically anyone whose name he writes in it, he can kill. And so this turns him into almost like a god, and he kind of starts to take justice into his own hands and killing people who he thinks deserve it. And there are a lot of moral questions to it and a lot of twists and turns. It almost reminds me of like Lost or Prison Break or one of those series where at the end of every episode there's another big twist to keep you going, you know? But I uh, would recommend. Then we have Guards Guards by Terry Pratchett. This is the first of the City Watch books in his Discworld series. A great place to start if you're wondering as well. And this basically follows what happens when a dwarf, who is actually a human who was ad ad adopted by dwarfs called Kara Iron Founderson, he goes to Ankh Morpork to find his fortune. At the same time, there are these uh, these kind of monks, these mysterious monks that are summoning dragons for their own nefarious purposes. Captain Vimes of the City Watch is a drunk and he may be the only hope the city has. It's just very funny all the way through. I actually did a full review of this, which I'll link to below. It was a reread for me for a rereadathon at 2019 that was uh, that's being organised by Alex Black and various other people. Very enjoyable, and uh, yeah, I gave it like a 5 out of 5 because it's amazing. It's one of my favourite Discord books, and uh, I will be reading more Discord this year as well, so watch out for more reviews. Okay, so up next we have got Alan Bennett, The Uncommon Reader. Now, this is basically about the Queen of England, and she discovers that there's a mobile library outside one of her palaces, and she goes there, borrows a book while she's there because she thinks it'd be impolite not to. Then she realises she has to return it and thinks, well, I'd better borrow another book while I'm here. And then she falls in love with reading, and we get to, you know, she's going on these stately processions, and she's waving out the windows of her carriage with a book open in her lap. Uh, the people at the palace are trying to stop her from reading because they don't think it's it's fitting for the Queen and then we have a nice little twist at the end of this as well I thought this was fantastic I think it's a book for readers you know if you only read one or two books a year you're probably not going to enjoy it too much but then you get some great bits like where the Queen is talking to the Prime Minister going oh you don't read Hardy do you oh he's such a bore and all this stuff so yeah great probably a 4.5 out of 5 this recommend Okay, then I read two stories out of this because I'd read the other two um, as individuals and like I'm counting them as individual books because they're usually published as individual books. So I read The Laying On of Hands and Father Father Burning Bright. Both of them were kind of 3.5 out of 5. Uh, I'll read you the blurb, the short blurbs of them here. So The Laying On of Hands, the painfully observant account of a memorial service for a Masur to the famous, and Father Father Burning Bright, the savage satire on the family of a dying man who rules over them from his hospital bed. So The Laying On of Hands was quite cool because I guess the main character is this masseuse to the stars and because he's dead and the entire thing takes place at his funeral, although you do have flashbacks and stuff, he's never like a living character despite being almost the centre of the story, you know? And then Father Father Burning Bright, I thought that was quite cool because you've got this juxtaposition of death and life, so while, you know, the uh, patriarch of the family is dying, uh, there's uh, somebody who's pregnant and about to give birth as well, so yeah. Just, and it's Alan Bennett as well, so really well written. They're not his best stories, but they were they were good enough. Okay, then we have Death Note Volume 4 by Tsugumi Oba and Takeshi Obata. Again, I'm not going to go too much more into this. We have uh, a sort of different antagonist comes into play in this. And uh, I don't know, I didn't like it as much as the start of the series, but I still kept, you know, going with it, still enjoyed it. Uh, it's probably like a 3.75 out of 5 for this one. Then we move on to the Ladybird book of The Hangover, and this is by J.A. Hazley and J.P. Morris. I've just been kind of picking these up as and when I see them. They are uh, Ladybird's children's books, but for adults. So this one is on the theme of hangovers. Here we have the, uh, that's the image from the front cover, and it says, uh, let me read it to you. It says, Len's mouth feels like he fell asleep tongue first on an antique bear pelt. His heart is galloping, his hair aches, and he worries that there is sweat building up underneath his fingernails. Len has come outside for some fresh air, but now remembers he is scared of fresh air today. Maybe the policeman can help. Can I get you a drink, Len? asks the policeman. So yeah, as you can see, it's quite humorous, uh, satirical, a lot of fun. 
Probably a four out of five for this, but it probably helps as well because I read it while I had a hangover. Then we have Ryanosuke Akutagawa, The Life of a Stupid Man. This is uh, Penguin Little Black Classic number 56. Japan's modernist master explores family art and the fear of madness in exquisite autobiographical pieces and a short story. And the autobiographical pieces in particular were super cool. They reminded me... I don't know, almost like Ezra Pound or someone like that, um, or Gertrude Stein. I'm going to read you uh, some of these. So we've got Pillow. Pillowing his head on his rose-scented scepticism, he read a book by Anatoly France. That even such a pillow might hold a god half horse, he remained unaware. Butterfly. A butterfly fluttered its wings in a wind thick with the smell of seaweed. His dry lips felt the touch of the butterfly for the briefest instant, yet the wisp of wing dust still shone on his lips years later. I'll do one more, I'll do moon. He happened to pass her on the stairway of a certain hotel. Her face seemed to be bathed in moon glow, even now in daylight. As he watched her walk on, they had never met. He felt a loneliness he had not known before. So yeah, it's just really beautiful. The short stories as well as these were the uh, autobiographical pieces there. And I, I don't know, it's just, I just really enjoyed it. Four out of five for me, but I enjoyed it purely from the writing as well. I mean, the subject matter was great, but the writing just, oh, yes. Yes. Okay, then we have a film it cuts to Luchador Monkey Crisis. This is by Ollie Jacobs. I picked this up for Todd and Dane's indie read along. And it was alright. Uh, the first book, uh, so the film it cuts, they're collections of short stories, each with 10 in. And the first one of these I really enjoyed, and it was actually one of my uh, top books of the quarter. This was just okay. It still had some of the sort of same problems in terms of slightly weird layout and. Um, uh, you know other bits and bobs, but also there were some pretty cool stories in there one that was almost like a poem And yeah, I mean I enjoyed it. I gave it a, probably a 3.5 out of 5 um, I didn't have too much to say about it Which is why I'm actually bundling this in with several others for my indie read along uh, You know video for the month. So yeah, it, it was it was just I but um, I would definitely recommend film it cuts one All right, then we have Edith Wharton the reckoning number 48 from the great writer of turn of the century New York, two devastating portraits of lonely widowhood and an unconventional marriage. And these were super well written. I actually read these in bed and so I sort of, I started with this first one, Mrs. Manstey's View. And um, yeah, and then moved on to The Reckoning. So Mrs. Manstey's View was actually her first published short story as well. And yeah, it was just well written, entertaining, probably a 3.75 out of 5. To be honest, it hasn't really stuck with me like some of the others have. But uh, I would like to read more Wharton at some point. Alright, then we have Death Note Volume 5 by Sugumi Oba and Takeshi Obata. And by this point I was kind of flagging, so I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. But I'm not sure how much of that is because of the, uh, you know, the actual contents of this, of this issue. Or whether it's just because I was trying to read them too closely together. I think you need to sort of space these out to get the most enjoyment out of them. But, um, yeah, it was, it was alright. Probably the weakest instalment of the lot, I think. But, uh... I don't want to spoil what I thought about Volume 6. <laughs> Here we have Black Beauty by Anna Sewell. And I actually talked about this. I've uh, done my wrap-up now of the box set of these. There were six of these in this, uh, this edition. The Robert Frederick Children's Classics box set. So uh, this was my least favourite of all the ones in the box set. But I think partly because the other ones I either really enjoyed or I'd read before. And so I at least had some sort of sort of childhood connection with it and you know that kind of uh, nostalgic vibe almost so uh, and I didn't get that get that with this I did still enjoy it I still gave it a 3.5 out of 5 and I think that's pretty good for it because I don't really like stories where the narrator is an animal for some reason it just it just does my head in a bit um, and I didn't cry as well and people said I was going to cry but I've only I've only ever cried at one book and uh, points points to you if you know what that book is I've mentioned it in tags and stuff so then I moved on to Agatha Christie, Death in the Clouds, and this is a Hercule Poirot book that not many people seem to have really heard of that much. And um, it takes place on an aeroplane, as you can guess from the title, or at least the murder does, and then uh, Poirot was actually on the plane. And obviously there's a limited number of people it could be, because it could only pe be people on the plane. So it's kind of like a, a locked room mystery, but in the sky. So that was quite cool. Poirot, I make no secret of the fact that Miss Marple is my favourite, although I, you know, I like Poirot, he's okay, he can be a bit insufferable at times. But he was, I thought, kind of at his best here, in terms of his uh, deductive powers and his reasoning. The other characters, not so much. Uh, some of them were pretty cool, some of them were just fairly bland and forgettable. But overall, it was like a, probably a 3.75 out of 5. Um, upper middle tier, like to Agatha Christie's top 40%, something like that. 
All right, then we have another one of these Ladybird books. So this is again by J.A. Aisley and J.P. Morris, and this is the Ladybird book of the Sicky. So as before, I will uh, read you a sample of it. So here we go, we have this image here, and it says, the boys are worried. Uncle Tony has not moved in two hours. He will make a miraculous recovery shortly after the Christmas washing up has been done, and just in time for the spy who loved me. Now here we've got, her boss may have called her bluff, but Verna still counts this as one of her better sickies. It's at least a week off, she says to herself, and I've always got the other kidney. So yeah, I'll give it like a 3.5 out of 5, it's okay, it's reasonably humorous, and uh, yeah, it is what it is. Okay, then we have Peter James, The Perfect Murder. This is a novella. It was actually uh, originally, I believe, put, yeah, it was originally published under the Quick Read scheme and then got published again by his, his actual publisher, uh, Pam McMillan. And so uh, I guess that just kind of shows that it was pretty successful. It's uh, 163 pages, so it's kind of novella length. And it's almost not as serious as some of his other stuff, although it is still dark. I mean, a murder happens in it, you know. And uh, we basically have this situation where both our husband and wife are both trying to kill each other, and they're both trying to plan the perfect murder. And uh, that's about all I want to say about it, because I don't want to spoil it. I think because it acts as a standalone as well, so it doesn't tie in with, like, say, his Roy Grace series or anything like that. Uh, you, it is probably quite a good way to pick up some of his work. He doesn't get to go as deep with the characterization as I would have liked, but then it is a novella-length story, and I believe these are original characters for this specific story as well, although I might be wrong. But I still enjoyed it. I Probably, looking back on it, I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5, I think. Um, you know, just, just right, and just the right length for the story as well, you know? Okay, then we have Death Note Volume 6 by Tsugumi Oba and Takeshi Obata, and this is the uh, culmination of um, of the the black edition books, and this one I gave probably a 4.25 out of 5 to. It kind of it came back up in quality again right at the end with this sort of big showdown there. The only problem is is that it turns out I remember the ending because I've seen the two Japanese movies and they basically cover the whole series, which I didn't realise. I thought they only covered the first, like, couple of editions. So by the time I got to the end of it, I was like, I know exactly what's going to happen here, which kind of ruined the surprise. But it was still very, very well executed, I thought, and the very final scene as well, which I can't show to you or talk to you about because it's a massive spoiler, but the very ending scene, uh, I thought, was, was beautiful. Really well done. So, yeah. Then we have Terry Pratchett, more, a Discworld big comic, illustrated by Graham Higgins. And this is basically a comic adaptation of more. You can't really call it a graphic novel because it is very much a comic. It's also very abridged as well, so a lot of it is missing, although it does still have that same kind of core storyline. I picked it up because I saw it in a charity shop and for like two pounds or whatever, I couldn't not pick it up and add it to my collection. But it isn't the best, it's all right. I mean, more is one of my favorite Discworld novels as well. Uh, would I recommend it? I would if you're a Discworld fan or if you're really into graphic novels and you want to get into the Discworld But um, it's, it's not as good as more the novel So I honestly would just suggest reading the novel, but uh, yeah 3.5 out of 5 and uh, That's probably one of the lowest ratings I've ever given a Terry Pratchett book So <laughs> all right, then we have anonymous Sinbad the sailor number 54 Adventures of shipwreck colossal beasts and fantastical islands from 1001 nights So I'm kind of familiar with the Sinbad story. I've never read like an incarnation of it before and actually it was really interesting. I can't remember any specific parts of it now just because I've been reading been reading so many of these little black classics that they start to to blend together a little bit. But um I believe as well this is only some excerpts. So this this shows you how abridged this collection is. It says this selection of stories is taken from the collection of seven stories entitled Sinbad the Sailor from Tales of 1001 Nights, Penguin Classics 2010. Tales from 1001 Nights is an abridged version of the three volumes published by Penguin Classics 2008. So this is basically double abridged, but uh, I mean, what do you expect for a 60 odd page book? But it was a great way to get into the legend of Sinbad, and uh, yeah, I, I thought it was really, like I say, really fascinating and really nice to get down to the, the root of the legend instead of seeing just like secondhand pop culture references. So, uh, three, no, sorry, four out of five for this. Next up we have Catalyst, I Hate and I Love. This is Penguin Little Black Classic number 69. By turns rapturous, erotic and despairing, this astonishingly modern verse tells of an ancient Roman poet's all-consuming infatuation with one woman. It does get a little bit creepy at times, I'm not going to lie, but the poetry itself is actually really good. I'm going to read you some here. Uh, o oh, elegant whore with the remarkably long nose, unshapely feet, lackluster eyes, fat fingers, wet mouth, and language not of the choicest. You are, I believe, the mistress of the hellrake for me anus. 
and the province calls you beautiful. They set you up beside my lesbia. Oh, generation witless and uncouth. Uh, I would probably give this like a 3.75 out of 5. I thought it was actually interesting how such old poetry could still feel relevant, you know? So I, I did enjoy it. Then we have Chuck Palahniuk, Paulinik, I don't know how to say his name. Somebody tell me in the comments, please, because I keep having to say it and I keep not being able to say it. Uh, this is Tell All. This is more kind of on the verge of literary fiction, whereas we quite often think of Paulinik as a, a, po a popular fiction writer, you know? Uh, here, it's basically following the story of the hired help of a celebrity, and she kind of feels as though she runs everything, she runs the household, she makes all the decisions for her, you know, she keeps her on the straight and narrow. And then this guy comes along who's basically writing a tell-all memoir of... Um, you know of his his life with her basically and she's kind of falling in love with him and uh you know the the, the hired help the uh like narrator of this story who is an unreliable narrator by the way um she's kind of telling the story of how she's trying to stop her, her mistress from marrying this guy who's basically just writing about her death it's all very unusual a lot of people have kind of given this fairly negative reviews but i enjoyed it i gave it like a 3.5 out of 5 it wasn't amazing but it was all right and i think you know people have criticized it for like not really nothing really happening in it but that's kind of the point it's very character driven so if you like character driven stuff you're probably gonna probably gonna enjoy that okay up next we have the brothers grim the robber bridegroom number 68 Drawn from German folklore, dark fantastical fairy tales of wicked deeds, gruesome punishment, and just rewards. So, I haven't read too much Brothers Grimm before, I have like read occasional stories here and there, and to be honest, this still really felt just like reading occasional stories. These are the translations from uh, David Luke. I would like to read all of the Brothers Grimm kind of collected stories at some point, but this still was very enjoyable. It's a pretty solid 4 out of 5, and I think a good way to kind of get a feel for their classic children's fairy tales. Then we have The Snow Angel by Lawrence and John. Now this is a beautiful book. I don't know if you can see the stars on it on the front are kind of reflective. We've got this ribbon. It's a hardback as well. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's got illustrations inside of it. And um, it also has a positive message. So I first came across Lawrence St. John when I, I interviewed her for my uh, book blog, not long after I launched. Here's one of the illustrations, look. And Basically, she's all of her books tend to have some sort of focus on animal rights, so this very much does have that. Um, it also kind of looks at things like uh, the state of what it's like to be an orphan in Kenya, uh, the slums where there are a lot of children living there. There's one character who's an albino, and they're basically being hunted because of these old sort of religious beliefs about magic and that albino bones and skin and whatnot should be used to make uh, magic. So there's a lot of stuff in this that's kind of food for thought certainly and uh, the main character in this is also a vegetarian which i thought was quite cool because she's like an 11 or 12 year old girl and it is like middle grade but i certainly enjoyed it as an adult as well uh, would i recommend it i mean i got it for a pound so if you can get this beautiful copy for a pound why not i don't know whether i'd recommend full price but also again if you if you have kids who are into animals and saving the animals and all that stuff definitely lawrence and john is a good author to read so I give that like a 3.5 out of 5. And we have Cat at Home by Kirsty Seymour Yaw. So this is basically just like a little coffee table book. It's got lots of uh, like photos of cats, very cute photos, and then some accompanying text. So uh, here's a quote from Theophile Gautier. Much soft such soft melting eyes, such a human and caressing look. It seems impossible that reason can be absent from it. Um, but it also has some of these like, like, here this bit about independent spirits. Let me read it. Cats have a celebrated independence of nature that makes their willing companionship all the more pleasing. You can't buy a cat's devotion. Bribes don't work, although they are rarely refused. Offering, ex offering affection and accepting love, a cat may choose to stay with you, but he remains a free spirit. And I don't know, there's just something about it that made it feel a little bit overwritten for me. I did like the photography, the photography was cute, but the writing kind of drove me nuts by the end of it. So I gave it a 3 out of 5, but it's fine for what it is, and you know, it would make a little gimmick, gifty book or whatever. Okay, then I read Yaroslava's Melnikas, The Last Day. This is a contemporary Lithuanian classic. And this is a very difficult book to describe because it's it almost read like a novel but with short stories in it. And um, like it's kind of very much literary fiction, but also some of the ideas and the concepts that kind of go through it. It kind of goes from one concept to another really sort of smoothly. Um, but yeah, it's, so it's like one overarching novel, but with these different concepts thrown in. So, for example, towards the start, there's this book that um, 
it's got everybody's death dates in it and so everybody starts to you know we start to see how society reacts to that and people start throwing death parties and all of this stuff then uh, later on there's a sort of a suburban family house and the rooms start to disappear one by one and we see kind of how that impacts the family as well so by the time it gets so small you know the, the father slash patriarch or whatever has ended up leaving home and he's not on speaking terms with the wife and the children and that and that sort of thing and then by the end we have this sort of weird magical cinema that there doesn't appear to be any staff for and he starts to investigate like how this cinema works uh, let me let me read you the blurb okay so having looked into it some more they are it is definitely classed as a short story collection and maybe I've got a little bit confused because I thought it was a novel going into it which probably didn't help but I, I did enjoy this still I gave it like a 3.75 out of 5 something like that and it's certainly it's interesting and I haven't seen anything like it before you know then we have Kate Chopin, A Pair of Silk Sockings, number 66. From Louisiana's remote bayous to its gilded cities, five startling stories of awakening by one of Fin de Sasaical's America's most daring writers. Sorry, I couldn't really pronounce that and had a little bit, bit of a mind blank there, but we'll roll with it. Uh, pretty cool short stories, definitely enjoyed her writing style. I liked how it reflected, you know, the fact that she's from, uh, you know, southern the southern states of America and uh, her voice definitely comes across in this. I thought it, thought it was also interesting because her date, so she was born 1850, died 1904 in St. Louis. So um, yeah, it really is like a snapshot of the times, if that makes sense, uh, in that part of the country. And I thought that was really interesting because it reminded me of, you know, how you get Victorian London writers and it really feels as though you're there. It sort of certainly it made me feel as though I was there in the story she was writing about. I'd like to read some more at some point. All right, then we have Night Shift by Stephen King, and this is a collection of his short fiction. It's got stories in like Children of the Corn. Uh, let, me, let me check which other ones are in there. Uh, Jerusalem's Lot, Graveyard Shift. Uh, Sometimes They Come Back, I like that one. Uh, the Lawnmower Man. And so, yeah, there were a fair old chunk of stories in this. The problem is that I had, I think with any short story collections, you like some more than others. With King, I'm kind of used to really loving some and then just liking some of the others. Whereas there were some in this that I just didn't like. It was towards the start of his career, which might be part of the reason why as well. Some of them were just a little bit ridiculous. But um, things like Children of the Corn, for example, I thought was excellent. Overall, I gave this like a 3.5 out of 5, maybe a 3.25 out of 5. It's probably the weakest of his uh, short story collections that I've read so far. But again, it's King, so I did still enjoy it. And I do plan to keep on reading all of his books eventually, you know. But um, yeah, possibly not one to start with. Although I do know that a lot of people really do love this book as well. So I, I really think it's just... What kind of stories you enjoy reading, you know? Then we have Colm Toibin, The Testament of Mary. Now, I picked this up from a charity shop because I remembered hearing somebody talk about it. And then today, as of the time of filming, I realised it was Hannah Tay's uh, April Book Club Book of, the, uh, Book of the Month pick. So this is what Hannah and uh, all of, you know, her book club people were reading. So I inadvertently joined in with that without actually, actually consciously meaning to. I did enjoy it though. I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. It's basically the story of Jesus but retold from the point of view of his mother Mary and um, you know she gets quite pissed off at him sometimes because you know he's Jesus he makes some you know some decisions that kind of later land him in trouble spoiler alert I don't know if you know what happens at the end uh, it reminded me of Philip Pullman's um, the the good man Jesus and the scoundrel Christ which I read last month and I did really enjoy that this one I didn't enjoy as much but it was still pretty good it was my introduction to Colm Toivin as a writer and uh, yeah I mean I'd, I'd read him again uh, I wouldn't necessarily specifically seek him out but I understand why this book was sort of well received but also I feel like it could be quite a con controversial one as well. Okay then we have Sappho Come Close number 74. Sensual sun-soaked verse on love and the gods in ancient Greece from the poet named the Tenth Muse by Plato. So what I didn't realise until like posting my review of this and looking at some images is that Sappho was a woman as well which is quite cool. Born in 630 BC, died 570 BC. I'm going to read you some of her poetry just so you can kind of get a feel for whether you like it. Spoiler alert I did. In all honesty, I want to die, leaving for good after a good long cry. She said, we both have suffered terribly, but Sappho, it is hard to say goodbye. I said, go with my blessing if you go, always remembering what we did. To me, you have meant everything, as you well know. Yet, lest it slip your mind, I shall review everything we have shared, the good times too. 
You called violets and roses bloom and stem. Often in spring, and I looked on as you wove a bouquet into a diadem. Time and again we picked lush flowers, wed, spray after spray in strands and fastened them. Around your soft neck, you perfumed your head. Of glossy curls with myrrh, lavish infusions in queenly quantities, then on a bed, prepared with fleecy sheets and yielding cushions, sated your craving. May gales and anguish sweep elsewhere, the killer of my character. But I am hardly some backbiter bent on vengeance, no, my heart is lenient. So yeah, really enjoyed this episode. I'd probably give it a 3.75 out of 5, this one. Not quite a 4, but uh, certainly, certainly interesting and I'm glad that I read it. Okay, then we have Sophocles' Antigone, number 55. The tragedy of Oedipus' daughter, a wise, fearless heroine who shuns society's laws, from the master Greek dramatist. So I think this is one of the earliest plays ever written or something like that. Born 496 and BC, died 406 BC. Uh, the play was written in its original Greek in or before 441 BC and is taken from the three Theban plays translated by Robert Fagels. Lovely. And yeah, so there are three plays in this sequence and I can't remember which way around it goes. I, I think this might be the first one to be written but the last one chronologically or something like that. I'm sure someone will, will correct me in the comments. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it actually. I, I found it was interesting because it reminded me of Romeo and Juliet and so I kind of started wondering how much of Romeo and Juliet is based on Antigone and uh, whether that's a thing, whether people have drawn those comparisons before, I, I'm sure they have or I'm going mental, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting in the way that it was kind of feminist and kind of really not feminist at the same time, which I thought was sort of certainly food for thought. Lots of just beautiful lines and stunning language in it as well. And um, I think it's just one of those one of those plays that I'm glad that I've now read. And I would like to see it performed at some point as well. Okay, then we have Video Nasties by Duncan Ralston, and I read this for Tarden Danes, indie read-along. And basically this is a collection of short stories by Ralston, who is a horror author. We both used to actually be, be, be uh, published by Book Trope back in the day. We are no longer, but um, yeah, I still keep up with them. And so it says here, author of The Method and Salvage, which I've read both of those in the past. I think again, with any short story collection, it's going to be a little hit and miss at times. And actually, I, I'm quite glad that I read this not long after Night Shift because it's a pretty similar rating. I think I gave this a 3.5. Uh, and also, this was probably going to be a kind of a lower rating until we get to Video Nasties, which is the final story in this collection. Obviously, the title story. And then we start to see how this cover relates back to it of like a, a hand coming out of a VHS tape with all these tentacles and stuff. And yeah, it's just kind of old school horror, almost inspired, I think by things like The Twilight Zone, certainly by Stephen King and uh, other other authors in that in that genre. Some stories can kill. Uh, yeah, so here we go. We've got some... Um, the blurb here kind of covers a few of the different concepts, so we'll go through it. This is a test. This is only a test. Italian director Nicolo Fanelli's lost film comes alive when the maven of the macabre is released after 20 years of VHS imprisonment. New hire Annie Watkins' preemptive obituaries at Live at Five News seem to be killing off famous people. A used delivery van causes Katie and Gavin's lives to take an unimaginable wrong turn into very dark territory. A teen orphan with a unique ability is held captive in a secret government lab, forced to submit to their whims. Vacation has become a grotesque part of the Easter festivities in a small English town. These are just a handful of the 16 dark tales that await you in video nasties. Tune in, sit back and turn up the terror. But don't touch that dial, it just might kill you. So yeah, 3.5 3 out of 5. Alright, uh, I had to film this a little a few days later because the footage went AWOL for some reason. Here is The Night is Darkening Around Me by Emily Bronte, number 63. Bronte's most passionate, powerful poems on death, nature's beauty and the passage of time. As always, I'm going to read you a poem. I will read The Night is Darkening Around Me as it's the uh, title poem. The night is darkening round me, the wild winds coldly blow, but a tyrant spell has bound me, and I cannot, cannot go. The giant trees are bending, their bare boughs weighed with snow, and the storm is fast descending, and yet I cannot go. Clouds beyond clouds above me, wastes beyond wastes below, but nothing drear can move me, I will not, cannot go. I'll come when thou art saddest, laid alone in the darkened room, when the mad day's mirth has vanished, and the smile of joy is banished from evening's chilly gloom. I'll come when the heart's real feeling has entire unbiased sway, and my influence o'er thee stealing, grief deepening, joy congealing, shall bear thy soul away. Listen, tis just the hour, the awful time for thee. 
Dost thou not feel upon thy soul a flood of strange sensations roll, forerunners of a sterner power, heralds of me? I would have touched the heavenly key that spoke alike of bliss and thee. I would have woke the entrancing song, but its words died upon my tongue. And then I knew that hallowed strain could never speak of joy again. And then I felt. So yeah, I mean, it's not really my kind of poetry, to be honest. So I'll give it like a 2.5, maybe a 3 out of 5. We'll give it a 3 out of 5, because I'm feeling generous right now. But uh, I do want to read some of Bront Emily Bronte's uh, fiction. Uh, but the poetry, certainly the poetry wasn't really, really for me. It's too old school. Sorry. Okay, then we have Speaking of Siva, number 79, this is by Anonymous. Four medieval Hindu saints approach sex and death through riddle and enigma in this mystical dev devotional poetry. Yeah, I, got, I managed to say that right in the end. Okay, let's read some here. It was like a stream running into the dry bed of a lake, like rain pouring on plants parched to sticks. It was like this world's pleasure and the weight of the other, both walking towards me. Seeing the feet of the master, O oh Lord, white as jasmine, I was made worthwhile. I'll do this one as well. For a wedding of dwarfs, rascals beat the drums, and whores carry on their heads holy pitchers. With hey hoes and loud hurrahs, they crowd the wedding party and quarrel over flowers and betel nuts. All three worlds are at the party. What a rumpus this is without our Lord of Caves. I'll give this one like a 3.5 out of 5. I'm not particularly religious or spiritual myself, but I did actually quite enjoy the writing. I, I suspect a lot of it was to do with the translations by A.K. Raman, Ramanajan, uh, first published in 1973. And uh, the poets involved here are Basavanya, Mahada Yivaka, Alama Prabhu, and Devara Dazimaya. Sorry, I cannot pronounce names, but I gave it a go. And then next up we have the Dhammapada, number 80. Ancient aphorisms on endurance, self-control, and perfect joy, widely acknowledged as the Buddha's own teachings. So let's flick in. Here are some on, our cra on cravings. If a man watches not for nirvana, his cravings grow like a creeper, and he jumps from death to death like a monkey in the forest, from one tree without fruit to another. And when his cravings overcome him, his sorrows increase more and more, like the entangling creeper called Barana. But whoever in this world overcomes his selfish cravings, his sorrows fall away from him, like drops of water from a lotus flower. Uh, and so on and so forth. I gave this a 4.5 out of 5. I actually thought it was really insightful and there's a lot of stuff in this that you could apply to your own life. I mean that was just for me flicking in and I'm currently trying to quit smoking again. I'm coming up on uh, two days which isn't much so I'm still feeling cravings at this point. Uh, so yeah I thought it was it was interesting to see how this kind of ancient work relate back to our modern life in the same way when you read something like The Art of War by Sun Tzu, for example, you can still take what you learn there and apply to our day-to-day -day life. So I thought that was pretty cool because of that, yeah. Okay, next up we have Doom 94 by Yanis Yonevs, and I don't want to say too much about this because I've actually filmed a full review, which will be out soon. This is basically a Latvian novel, and it's set in 1994 in a city called Yelgava in Latvia, and basically uh, communist rule has just kind of gone away because uh, the, the Russians, the Russians who'd been uh, occupying Latvia had withdrawn. So Latvia kind of opened up more to the rest of the world and in this book, you know, the main character is sort of 15 years old, he's discovering drink and drugs and cigarettes and girls and death metal and that's kind of what made it so cool, all of the different references to different death metal groups and black metal. I mean, he starts off listening to Nirvana and uh, because it's set in 1994 to begin with, it, you know, we have Kirk Cobain's Suicide. And um, it's just really, really just a really fascinating novel. It's not, there aren't many novels like this, you know? I'm going to read the uh, the blurb on the back of this just to give you a better feel for it. But it's, uh, it's actually, it actually takes the form of a testimonial from a guy called Dave Windass. Rarely does a book capture the imagination of entire generation. Yanis Yonev's Doom 94 is that beast. Via the underbelly and young people of Yelgava in 1994, the writer takes us on the wild trip in Jordan enjoyed by those who experienced their youth at the point when Latvia was gaining its independence for the second time. Having left behind cultural chaos, these kids embraced freedom and the opportunity to transcend the USSR by turning to the alternative lifestyle offered by heavy metal. Here, translated into English for the first time, Yonevs presents a detailed depiction of those heady days through the eyes of those who were there. This was a time for the growing army of metallurgists to stick two fingers up at state-dominated life and explore what the world had to offer through a shared love of music and all that comes with it. Doom 94 was an immediate cult classic when published in its mother tongue and is an exploration of what it is to be released from the rigours of a regime that throttled personal expression. And I gave this a 4.5 out of 5 and would definitely recommend it and look forward to the review. Okay, next up we have two books by Jeffrey Brown. This is Darth Vader and Son and Vader's Little Princess. I gave Darth Vader and 
Sun a 4 out of 5, Vader's Little Princess a 3.5 out of 5. And basically, I saw Darth Vader and Son on Madman Reads and Rocks' channel, and it's uh, made me want to pick it up. So I ordered it online, and it arrived. And then the day after it arrived, I saw Vader's Little Princess in a charity shop. So I thought it'd be crazy not to pick it up. And basically, they're just sort of cartoons based in the Star Wars world of uh, so we've got in uh, Darth Vader and Son it's Vader and a baby Luke Skywalker and in this one it's Vader and uh, and uh, Princess Leia so here we've got Luke pick up your toys right this instant uh, Luke I am your father do you want to time out and then here we have him saying you are not going out dressed like that and she's wearing the uh, the slave Leia outfit that the Jabba the Hutt made her wear Okay, and finally for the month of April, we have uh, The Story of Houses and Homes, a Ladybird Achievements book by Richard Bowood. I've just realised as well, this has got inside on the inside cover, it says P. Edwards, January 1970. And yeah, it's just a Ladybird book that tells you the story of how kind of houses and domiciles evolved throughout the years. So we've got the Norman Castle here, go through to half-timbered houses, all the way up to like modern council blocks. Here's the Victorian Gothic house. And uh, yeah, I've just been slowly build, picking these up to build up my Ladybird collection. I enjoyed it well enough. I gave it probably a 3.75 out of 5. And I will be picking up more Ladybird, more Ladybird books soon. And that has brought us to the end of the month. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments which of these books you've read. And if so, what you thought of them. That didn't make any sense, but we'll roll with it. I'm pretty tired. <laughs> hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.